I'm Scott Allen Miller. It's the 15th of January, 2024. This is my vlog of daily life living in Leo, Nicaragua. Today I was filming the, the episode for yesterday and as soon as I got back to my desk, I had some comments from someone who was looking at buying some property somewhere on one of the beaches here in Nicaragua. And uh, I decided it was a perfect time to grab the dogs, head outside. Are we gonna go do the video for the day? Oh, we are. Let's go do the video. This is her favorite. The camera is set up. And so she is going to be a maniac. She's out here barking and barking and running because we're outside doing the video. It's her favorite time of day. And film a follow-up response to this because it is a topic that I think needs to be addressed because I think a lot of people are either misleading themselves or being misled by people who may just have misled themselves as well, uh, but in some cases are looking to manipulate the market a little bit to their own advantage or maybe just don't want to see you succeed but probably not too much of that but we're going to get to exactly what we're talking about at land ownership after the bump. If you've looked at buying land somewhere near a beach in Nicaragua probably people have talked to you about the lease system. Now before we get into this too much I want to give you a couple definitions. There's basically three ways of having property here in Nicaragua. I'm sure there's others, not a property expert, but these are basics, right? One is called a real. This means that you have essentially a deed, but it's called a real, and it goes back to the Spanish crown. It means that that property has been deeded by the king himself, and so it carries different weight than things that are deeded later. Anything that's deeded later is by a local government, which could be the federal government here in Nicaragua, or it could be the city government or whatever. Those things are less official, less central, less historic. It's impossible to get a deed that is older than the real. So the reals carry a certain amount of weight uh, because they are guaranteed to predate anything else and should never have been disrupted. They, they can't be, they just get passed on. So people are willing to pay a premium under certain circumstances to get a property that is held under a real because it gives them the most protection, the most flexibility, the most rights. So they tend to be uh, a premium and incredibly rare. So don't expect to encounter one. Most people will never talk about it. They do exist and people do seek them out from time to time. The more common form of land ownership that you have all over the country is just the normal. People don't really have a term for it, but it's generally referred to as deeded properties. This is where you get the normal deed. You do the normal things just like you do in the US or anywhere else and you think nothing of it. It seems completely normal so you don't you th think of it as like a thing that requires a term, right? It's just normal land ownership. But you know that normal land ownership involves a deed, so we call it deeded land ownership. In this case, you own the land the same as you would anywhere else, uh, and there's nothing weird to know about it. Like, it's very straightforward. That's what almost everyone is going to be dealing with uh, if you're looking at buying land. Of course, if you're looking at like a condo or you're in an HOA, you may not own the land. That's a different thing. That's where you're part of an association or something. So that gets murky. But we're talking about land ownership here. So if you were actually to buy a plot of land, you would expect to get a deed. If you were to encounter a real, you would either consider yourself incredibly lucky that you found a real or unlucky that you had to pay a premium because it was held under a real and other people would outbid you if you didn't pay more uh, one way or another. It depends how you look at it, but most of us are willing to pay more for a real. The question is how much more? The other type of land ownership, and this doesn't tend to come up too much except with expats because expats have a tendency to like to own property on the beach. And there are some beaches, but not all, in Nicaragua where the uh, oceanfront property is not held under a deed and is not held under a real, but is held under an indigenous community. And they do a 99 year lease system where, and to the best of my knowledge, this is the same throughout the country. Um, maybe the different communities have some different rules, but this is my understanding. And as someone who has worked with this multiple times, um, you know, we are somewhat experienced with it is that you get uh, when you purchase the property and we think of it as purchasing a property you work through it like you're purchasing a property you act like you're purchasing a property you go and you buy this property and instead of receiving a deed per se you get a lease from the indigenous community who technically owns the property that lease is for 99 years and it renews to 99 years anytime that the the property is to change hands and that includes if you were to sell it from yourself to your spouse from your spouse to a business you own from a business you own to your children and so forth and it doesn't necessarily uh, require a sale it could be involved in a gift or a will or something like that so uh it's it's 
uh, essentially a length of time so long that it will not affect anyone during their lifetime. It's essentially impossible to, to buy or lease uh, one of these lots um, in such a way that it would expire during your lifetime. So the design is always that it would go on to a child's lifetime. And since the movement of the property to a child automatically renews it to another 99 years, unless you were giving it to an infant and that infant happened to live to over the age of 100 and didn't want to pass on that land before turning 101, it won't be a problem and it doesn't affect you in any way because of the auto renewal. And, and if it did affect you, if you had all those things happen, well, they just need to get a lawyer together and form a corporation and shift it over. If you're really that concerned about keeping a thing over 100 years, then there's ways to do it where you could keep it, not have to hand it over to someone. It's never happened in the history of the country, right? But should it happen, there are ways to do that. So the 99 year lease thing is not something where you worry about it expiring ever. That's not on the cards. It, it doesn't expire, right? The mechanism until they make humans live much longer than they do, the concept of the lease expiring does not exist. And in reality, and this is me hypothesizing, but I'm quite certain of this, there is no mechanism for the 99 year lease. The only reason that that exists is when a company holds it so that the company has to do something after 99 years so that it is not automatically held by a trust that evaporates and no one can ever use the property again because it's held by an ephemeral organization that no one can find. They would have to show up every 99 years and do something to maintain that property. So is this a negative? Is this something you should worry about? When I'm talking to foreigners, I seem to get an awful lot of response. And this is what just happened to me today. Someone said, well, I'm certainly trying to avoid the lease system. I'm like, you would try to avoid the lease system? Why? Now, I didn't get a reason yet, but I've had other people say this to me. And it's a really common response. Oh, I'm concerned about the leases. I'm worried about the leases. This I find incredibly strange because there's no downside to them. There are downsides to working in the indigenous community. Uh, for example, it may take more effort, you may need to become more involved, and there are fees associated with that, additional taxes, I should say, not exactly fees. They're not crippling, and they wouldn't be reasons that I would necessarily avoid working in an indigenous community, but they're not technically part of the lease. They may be triggered by the lease, but they're not actually part of it. So if you want to use those numbers as a reason that you know, well, all the leases I could find are tied to these numbers. Great, that makes sense. But if you're just talking about the lease itself, this makes no sense. I have no clue why someone would ever want to avoid it. As someone who owns different types of property, the thing that I want most is a real because it gives me the most power. But in most cases, I can't get that. You just get lucky getting a real. You never choose it, not realistically. I mean, you could really hold out and be like, I'm not gonna buy any property that doesn't have a real, but the real will dictate what you can buy and you'll just end up with whatever. You will never be able to seek it out and, and, and you know say, well, I wanna be on this beach with this house, blah, 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 and I want a real. It doesn't work that way, right? You could go to a hundred houses and never encounter one. Most people have never seen one or heard of it. It's very confusing and very rare, but it's kind of like finding gold berries on your property if that's what you find well good for you you sc you scored but other than that people look at deeded and leased property as the realistic options that they may actually encounter in real life and what you often see is people who go to the beaches say well this area of the beach is under lease so i want to either be there because i want a lease or i want to not be there because i don't want a lease here's the reality it comes down to this you shouldn't do that it shouldn't be a consideration i have no idea why someone would make that enough of a consideration to affect their land purchasing decisions. It seems crazy to me. It just doesn't matter, right? If you were to look at it from a which land is least perspective, well, almost always you would want the lease, not the deed, because the leases are for the more valuable property because it's where they feel they need to protect it the most and what the indigenous community has fought for. So if you want property on the sand in much of the country, it's gonna have to be a lease. Now, obviously that's the most valuable property. That's the premium spots for most people, not everyone. Uh, some, you know, some people really wanna be off beach. Some people really fear tsunamis. Some people really like a view from a mountainside. Great, that's not related to the lease. That's related to your view, right? So that's cool. If that's what you want, then who cares, right? Great, don't worry about the lease. But if you're looking at what's premium property or if you like the beach and you wanna be on it, the lease is going to be, in many cases, on the spots you want to be. Now, in some places like San Juan del Sur, I don't believe there are indigenous leases 
on the waterfront, but in that particular case, there are government leases on the waterfront that act the same. And, and now maybe I'm wrong. Maybe those are indigenous and I just perceive it as government. My understanding, because I have looked at buying there, um, is that uh, one, a lot of that land is protected as historic. And so it acts like a lease. You have absolutely no control over what you can do on the property. We tried to buy a house, couldn't do anything, couldn't make it into a, a habitable structure. We were not allowed to do that, so we didn't buy it. Right. And the things that are on the sand are just leases from the government or maybe from an indigenous community. So even in San Juan del Sur, this is how it works. So those are the premium spots. With the uh, majority of the country, when you're looking at leases, it's simply leases are the premium properties and deeds are the less premium one. That's about it. And that's all you need to know. And, and whether it's a lease or not, yes, your lawyer needs to know when doing the paperwork. That's really the extent of it. If if I was pushed to a position where I had two essentially identical pieces of property and the only difference was one was deeded and one was leased. Well, I think it's pretty obvious I would want the least one. And that's what's really strange to me is I universally hear people say, I am working to avoid the lease to the point where they're making their entire decision making around the lease and then picking the lesser of the two options as what they want which I can't figure out what would make them want to go with a deed, which is the most risky form of property. Deeds are problematic because they are the least stringent, meaning there's the least amount of work that goes in behind them. So if there was going to be one of those stories, right? If you hear those stories of, oh, I bought a property and I got scammed on it. And there's like all these things. Chances are that was a deed that it happens on a real. I've never heard of that happening. But then again, I've heard of very few transactions on a real. So <laughs> that may be anecdotal. They're so rare that it doesn't really matter. What a real does or doesn't do probably doesn't affect anyone. And when you do hear of problems, uh, as far as I know, they are always on deeds. If someone's going to misfile something, someone's gonna try to scam you on something, it pretty much has to be a deed. Leases have so much oversight because of the indigenous community making sure that everything works the way that they want it to, that they know what's going on, that they register things in duplicate. It's very hard to scam a system or to have something go dramatically wrong when you're dealing with the indigenous community leases, simply because there are so many more checks and balances that the things that go wrong with deeds just don't seem to go wrong there. I'm not saying nothing could go wrong. You need to cross your T's, dot your I's, do your due diligence, make sure you have a lawyer and all that stuff. Don't skip that stuff. But I would trust a lease, far, a lease far more than a deed. Not that I wouldn't trust a deed. I have no problem buying deeded property. Not that I'm trying to scare anyone away from deeds. Just saying if I had equal property and had to choose based on that one factor, I would pick the lease absolutely and have. Now I've never had two identical properties, probably no one ever has, where I had to pick in that way, but I am a person who has purchased leased land and have absolutely no regrets for doing so and had no qualms at the time for doing so and have no comprehension of any of the reasons that people try to tell me why they're concerned about it. Now, all that stuff, I think, leans a little bit towards leases, but I have one reason that for me, I find very important with the leases. And that is when you have leased property or at least leased property under an indigenous community, I don't know about San Juan del Sur. I just can't speak to it on that particular little spit of land that happens to be leased. I don't know if it's indigenous, but for the rest of us, right? If we're leased, it's indigenous. And those indigenous communities have some power on the beach. And where that power becomes really important is when your neighbors have abandoned their lots. If you're elsewhere in the country and you have an abandoned lot, you have one of two essential options that could take place. One is that it remains abandoned. And now you have a decrepit property that is lowering everyone's property values and there's nothing you can do about it. The other possibility is worse. And that is that you get squatters who move onto it, take it over and seize it over a period of time because it was that abandoned. In some ways that's better because they have to do some amount of improvement to qualify as squatters, but that improvement is really minor and generally won't be something you're gonna be happy with. It'll often be a partially finished shed so that over a period of time, they can finish a little bit more of the shed piece by piece and claim continuous improvement as is required under the squatting laws. So you don't really want that as much as it sounds great. Oh, they'll improve the property and I don't have to spend a penny. That sounds good. Get some squatters in there. It doesn't work that way. You will never actually be happy with squatters. As happens in most of the world, people who do squatting are not the people you want as neighbors. I'm not saying that's hundred percent true somewhere. There's a really sweet swatting, squatting couple, swatting squapple who, uh, you know, would be fantastic neighbors and they just can't afford a house. And this is what they've done. And, but 
squatting is a huge risk that you get caught before you are able to enact the squatting laws. So it's always done by someone who's either just has nothing to lose or um, has an incredibly flexible lifestyle where they're they're willing to take a huge risk on that being kind of their investment. Uh, and it, it's a big risky one, right? Um, and, and they can't do a huge improvement because they could lose it uh, depending on how it goes, depending on who owns the property or how, how good their lawyer is or how quickly they get caught. Because the last thing you wanna do is, I don't know if it's two years or 10 years you have to squat before it could become yours. The last thing you wanna do is do something like 9.9 .9 years of squatting, build a house, make a life, call it your home, everyone knows it start raising kids and have the owner show up and be like ha, 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 I got three days left before we hit the 10 years you're out of here and I'm having you arrested if you're here tomorrow right you don't want to have to deal with that <laughs> that's a huge risk so you end up being stuck having a barely improved property that you basically have to hide from anyone noticing that you're improving until such time as you become the owner's which is so much time that it just, it's a terrible situation. So people who are squatting are generally uh, uh, in, in a terrible life situation and they're trying to make the best of it. And kudos to them for doing what they need to do. I'm not complaining about squatters in, those, in that circumstance. I'm simply saying that if you're the person who lives next door, you probably don't want to own a nice house or have a place where you're making a homestead and have the person directly against your wall squatting. So. <laughs> those are your options, squatters, or it just falls into disrepair and is abandoned. I don't like those options. That's why I like the lease system. The lease system uh, allows under certain circumstances, and it's extreme, and I don't really see this happening much, but it does exist, is that the indigenous community can be brought forth a property that has been abandoned. And if the indigenous community so desires, only if it's abandoned, they can attempt to contact the people who own it, try to get them to do something, and if they don't, they do have the power to seize it in a way that other people do not. Other properties cannot be seized, right? If you have a normal deed, the government is blocked from doing what it needs to do to do anything to improve your property. Now, maybe you get lucky and someone didn't pay their taxes, maybe the government can do something under those circumstances. But even with that, we generally see that even places that don't pay their taxes, the people may be banned from using the property until they pay those taxes, but that doesn't help you either. Now you have a property where they're not allowed to do anything and they owe a bunch of money that they're never gonna pay. Now you're extra screwed. So you really don't wanna have those kinds of problems. And I'm not saying they come up a lot, but they do come up and you do see them around the country. But with the, the leased properties, you also see these abandoned lots, but you know a couple things. One is that if they try to just abandon it and it hits that 99 years, I get it, it's 99 years, it's not gonna help you. But if you're like me and hope to leave a property to your children, I know that if the place next to me is abandoned for my lifetime, that somewhere during their lifetime, it's gonna be available one way or another. Either the person is gonna have to come and do uh, improvements on it, or they're gonna be able to seize it or someone else is gonna be able to buy it. The indigenous community is going to be able to fix that problem eventually. That's not an ideal situation, but it is a worst case situation that, and most of those properties that are abandoned have already been abandoned for somewhere between five and 70 years, right? So you're, you're talking about leases that may actually be coming pretty close to being over. You're, you don't expect someone to buy a property today and abandon it tomorrow and have 99 years before it runs out. It's not gonna be like that. Uh, it's much more likely that someone bought it prior to 1979 and then fled the country, possibly bought it in the 1980s, fled the country, or bought it in the 1990 to 94 kind of range and then fled the country. Those are the most likely ones to be abandoned and those all have 20, 30, even 50 years on their lease clock already run out. It's not 100% true, but that's the ones that you're likely to find that's the, with problems. Those are the most likely. So even with those, before that 99 year clock runs out, if those people have truly fled the country, truly completely abandoned the place, it's really falling down. If it's dangerous, if it's unimproved, if it's de-improved, anything like that, in theory, you can go to the indigenous community and be like, let's try to fix this. And they do have some power of eminent domain that gives them the ability to help the community. This is where eminent domain is a positive when you're not able to seize someone's home, you're not able to seize someone's active property, you're able to seize something that has been abandoned and do something with it. 
so that it doesn't hurt other people. And here in Nicaragua, that abandoned property thing is one of the most significant problems we have when it comes to discussions of real estate, right? If you wanna talk about problems in the country, right? Unemployment is probably our number one problem. But if you wanna talk about real estate related problems, I would say our number one problem is the, the risk of abandoned properties. And this comes from a number of places, but primarily because it's a low income country, there are two things that happen. One is that there are people who are local. They eventually get control of a property, often through inheritance, but no, it could be investment too. And then for some reason, they get an opportunity to leave the country and they just forget about it. Like, oh, at the time they saved up for years. They spent $3,000 to get a lot. It's a lot that's in the middle of a bunch of other things. They thought they put a house there. They were gonna make a life. And then they got an opportunity to take a job somewhere in another country. And a $3,000 lot that they haven't built on yet is maybe going to cost them more than $3,000 to deal with. They don't care, they're out of here. It's not worth selling it. They don't know how they would deal with it. They don't wanna deal with the paperwork. So you have an abandoned lot. They now are making a life in another country, out of sight, out of mind. My grandparents bought a lot in El Paso, Texas in the 1960s. We didn't find out that that lot existed until they passed away. They never once went and looked at it. They never improved it. They abandoned it for 60 years. I know nothing of it. I have no idea what happened but it was that easy. And that was in the United States. That was in the same country that they lived in, right? It was just too far away for them to go visit. For some reason, they thought El Paso was gonna be a boom town. I have no idea what they were thinking. Uh, but that kind of thing happens here. And then they move on to another country. And you know, if they pass on, their children will have no idea that they officially inherited an empty lot somewhere in a place they've never been and may not even know exists, right? Not just they don't know the lot exists, they may not know Nicaragua exists, right? You're talking about some really seriously abandoned lots through that process. The other thing that also happens because it's a poor country is that a lot of times expats come down and there's a ton of the San Juan del Sur is famous for this problem. You don't see this so much in other parts of the country. San Juan del Sur, this is extreme. They come down and there are so many people trying to sell you lots as an expat. They'll sell you a lot, a house, something, right? Oh, you got to buy, you got to invest, they'll do all this thing. So there's entire hillsides that were purchased by Americans during a time when they were promised it was a boom and then the property values dropped and what they spent maybe 10 or 20 or $30,000 on, maybe $100,000, probably not, dropped to two to maybe 10,000 tops. And now they don't wanna sell it because they lost all their money. They don't wanna build on it because it's just a whole, a whole bunch of empty lots and everyone else isn't building either. And they don't wanna build because what would they do with it? They don't like being here. They're upset with the place. They've moved on. It, they didn't come back the next season and now they're gone. They forget that it exists or they're angry about it. Now you have whole critical parts. Some of the most valuable property in the country is abandoned en masse so that nobody can even, even if you got one of those lots, you wouldn't want to improve it because of the, all the guaranteed empty lots from other abandoned abandonees. You have no water supply, no internet access, no roads, no improvements to the infrastructure because there's no houses. So if you were to build one, you'd be all on your own. It's not like a new development where in theory, the lots are available and some other people might come along and buy them or you could buy them if you had to and, and put in more houses, maybe do rentals, whatever. Because they're abandoned lots, you would have to use eminent domain to get access to them. You may not even have, in many cases, no one has the information as to who the owner is. So you don't even have someone to reach out to. That's a Nicaragua problem in general. They really need better contact services for different lots. So that's a, a major step that, that would need a lot of backing from a lot of different departments, and it would be a technical challenge in the first piece. So it's, it's very large challenges. All of that is to say, there are really strong reasons why I want the lease. The lease gives me the most protections of my ownership, the most protections against my neighbors, the most protections for the quality of my paperwork. And the whole lease aspect of it has absolutely, this is important, zero negatives. There is nothing negative about it. That's the thing I don't understand. There is clear advantages and I can't figure out what people perceive as a negative. An auto renewing 99 year lease that renews in perpetuity based on any transaction, including death, wills, transfer to businesses, transfer to spouse, sale, anything. It's fantastic. It is a level of ownership I don't have the option of in the United States. Not that that's a big deal that I don't have it. US deeds are very good, but if I could get a 99 year lease system in the United States, the same as we have in Nicaragua, it would be just that itty bitty bit 
better than the standard deed system. The US has a much better computerized system to be able to identify who owns or has a potential claim on a piece of property. So that's an important piece. And that's something that I think people often overlook. They get scared of the system in Nicaragua, but instead of acting logically and saying, okay, I have this risk and I want to mitigate it. They emotionally react and say, I heard about this risk. And instead of mitigating it, I'm going to trigger it by acting emotionally and not doing the thing that protects me from it, but instead doing the thing that exposes me to it. Now, why are so many people told about the leases in such a negative way? Well, I assume that the majority of people who are informing others about the leases have done no research themselves, are not knowledgeable of the real estate market, hear the term lease and imagine something that they don't know anything about, make up some facts about it that don't actually apply, and then tell people these negatives and, and basically present it as, a, well, I was smart enough not to fall for that, right? And they don't actually understand what they didn't fall for. What they did do is fall for the deed system. Yeah, that's probably what's happening most of the time. But for sure, if you watch the comments on my channel, you will notice it's not that common, but maybe one out of 50 to 80, maybe 100 posts is someone who's upset that we're letting people know about the country. They don't like foreigners learning that Nicaragua is safe, friendly, has healthy food, has beautiful lots, is affordable, any number of things. They don't want to see more foreigners come. And that could be a mix of things. It may be that they want foreigners, but they only want them to be tourists who leave. They don't want long-term ones, or they don't want expats. They want immigrants coming in and staying. But I do get sometimes just, I wish you wouldn't tell people about it. Please don't expose it. It'll ruin it for everyone else. And a lot of the times it is expats, not Nicaraguans right? It could be Nicaraguans. I've had Nicaraguans who are like, we don't want gringos here, but that's very rare. And every time that's been said, it feels like the person saying it was actually in the United States and not actually in Nicaragua. I can't guarantee that, but that is my impression. And certainly it's likely that only most are in the United States, if that's true, not all. But we'll assume it is really not a thing. Nicaraguans are not looking to get rid of the expats because they know we're not bringing big negatives and we are bringing really important parts of the economy and real estate market that they need so we're helping even if they maybe don't really want us around but generally they do but the thing you see even more is expats who are hoping to artificially keep the land prices down especially the premium ones which is the beaches which are often the leases and they don't want other expats bringing up the prices so that they're able to get better prices themselves in the future because they at least imagine that they'll want to do that so that's where i think you'll find of those who know anything about the market and that's the reason i think that you're seeing people give out this misinformation because it's self-serving if all the new expats think leases are bad they will avoid them bringing down the prices of the actual high quality leased waterfront so that the people who previously were struggling to pay for it or maybe saving up over time can swoop in and buy it without any competition which i mean in reality there is no real competition but in theory people are scared of other people coming in and raising the prices you see that said by expats on a regular basis on the comments here and other places so we know this is a real sentiment that people are worried about not realistic that that's going to happen but if you have that reaction, your emotional response would often be to mislead new people, which we know is an entire industry here of misleading people about real estate. There is a huge cultural trend completely within the expat community, has nothing to do with Nicaraguans, where existing expats are here trying to mislead or outright trick and scam new uh, expats who are moving into the country, both in real estate, that's the main one, but also in investments, that's the secondary one. Almost every new expat, unless you completely avoid the expat communities like Granada and San Juan del Sur, you are going to be inundated with real estate agents who have a whole bunch of information for you about how to buy a house and how expensive it is and how hot the market is and how you don't want leases and investors who have some brilliant business idea that no one in Nicaragua has figured out they need and no one has actioned and they have some secret sauce that's going to make them lots of money but has not managed to make them money yet but it definitely will sometime in the future if only they have your investment money because their investment money didn't do it those are the two scams that you see pretty much everywhere and both of those you can see how they would create a trend of telling people that the leases are bad and then once they say it the people who are knowledgeable trick 
other people into saying it, then those people don't buy the leases. And then those people feel afraid of the leases. They have no reason to ever look into them further because they didn't buy them themselves. And then they repeat this fearful knowledge because they just are repeating the thing they were misled on and never look into it. So you end up with a lot of people who are told this. And when you say the word lease, it sounds kind of scary, right? Oh, I don't want to lease a car. I don't want to rent a house, right? You see it all the time right? All the people who say mortgages are better than rental. Not when you do the math, of course, but when you just say it, everyone has a knee-jerk reaction. And especially if you're coming from America, we did some episodes on this, the United States government and the banking industry and a lot of other people who are just trying to make money on, on selling you services for houses like the realtor market and all the real estate agents, they all have a lot of money to be made by convincing you that you want to buy a house, not rent, no matter how obvious renting is better most of the time. Not all, but most, same thing happens here because you have this built in owning is good, leasing and renting are bad. It doesn't take very much for the word lease on a property deal to automatically create a negative connotation in your mind and you will be easily led down the garden path by someone who has some reason to gain from you by having you buy something in a deeded area and not raising the prices in the, the leased area. It also, of course, could be someone who has a deeded property that wants to sell it to you. And if you know how good the leases are, you would just buy on the on the waterfront because that's what you want, right? So if they want to talk you into being off the waterfront, it's a great scare tactic. And really, once you say it to people, if you have any credibility and you say lease, all oh, the waterfronts leased, indigenous communities, it's easy to imagine in the United States that being a scary thing. So you just apply that here. Well, it must be scary here too. That's completely reasonable. So you don't look into it further and you move to wherever it is they happen to have deeded property for sale or whatever. So that, it makes sense why it works, but we need to step back and say, but it isn't how it actually works. And we need to actually apply logic, look at the real facts about how it functions. Is there a reason why all the, the big investors in the country are all perfectly happy working with that. It's only the newcomers. It's only the people who aren't ha having viable businesses, right? It's all these little tiny uh, things off in the places that are running illegal businesses. Now, it is worth noting leased property because it's premium property is much less likely to be able to function as an illegal business, such as a money laundering operation where money is being paid in one country and services are being rendered in another. That is a really common soft form of money laundering that happens in any market, right? But this one too, be aware those types of businesses are extremely popular with expats and often the amount of money that they're maneuvering between countries is small enough that no one actually cares. And they're not doing anything nefarious with the money, they're just avoiding taxes. That is nefarious, I suppose, depending on how you look at it, but they're not like trying to fund a rebellion or something, they're just Try, and they're not trying to hide illicit money. They're just trying to not pay taxes. You could think of it as tax, uh, tax avoidance, but it's uh, by it, they're doing it through a banking trick, right? Which makes it laundering of a sort because you're unable to track the source of the money uh, and its transactions. So that type of thing is extremely common in expats. And I'm not gonna say it's a terrible thing, I don't, whatever, right? But be aware, a lot of the people who have properties in the country that are expats are doing those kinds of things and they're taking credit card payments that go outside the country so they're not paying their taxes to the government. If they were to do that same thing on the waterfront and premium properties that happen to be leased, it's not the lease that creates it, it's the premium property that gets the eyeballs on it, it would be much less likely that they could do that without scrutiny and not get caught. And so that may also be a reason why people who are unable to run successful businesses or unable to afford premium property for their houses uh, may have a negative attitude towards those properties, either because they just perceive it as negative because it doesn't meet their needs, uh, or they have a bitter sour grapes reaction to it because they don't like that other people may be able to be successful there or be able to afford a home there when they can't or it's just an emotional reaction and they never looked into it whatsoever and they're passing on bad information based on their own emotional reactions. Who knows? But now you have the power, the more you know, star flies across the screen, you have the power to make good decisions uh, for yourself as to what makes sense for you. And I'm not saying rush out and buy all the leased property, I'm just saying buy the property that makes sense for you. Do not treat the lease as a negative. If you're going to have it be a factor whatsoever, it should be a positive one, not a negative one, but not a big one, it doesn't make leased properties aren't magically better than deeded properties. It's if you had two properties that were otherwise equal, leased would be better. That is a concept that should be one of the simplest things in logic. And yet, 
even trained logicians seem to often get confused on it. It should be super straightforward that it's, it's a positive, but it's not a deciding factor. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. That would be much appreciated and does so much to help make this show possible. As always, go check out our other channels like Nika Roomba or Nicaragua 360, Drive Warp or Take Flight with Scott. By joining those channels, watching those shows, you also help support this one and all the work that we do. Very much appreciate all of you who live inside now my little Fuji box, which I am absolutely loving. And uh, if you could like and subscribe, that would mean a lot. Share this on social media, post it on the Reddits, the Facebooks, the Twitters, and tell your friends, family about the show, get them to watch, get everyone to watch an extra episode. Let's get this show growing in 2024, and I will see all of you tomorrow.